This mini-movie is a crime-slash-drama starring Gerard Butler and Jamie Foxx. A family man, whose wife and daughter were murdered by two burglars in front of his eyes drives him to become hellbent on vengeance where the criminal justice system can't even stop him. Try guessing the Rotten Tomato score by the end. There will be spoilers, let's get started. Our movie opens with Clyde Shelton happily playing with his five-year-old daughter while his wife is in the kitchen preparing dinner. They heard knocking at the door and his wife asked him to go and open the door. Since they were not expecting any guests, he thought his wife ordered food. But when he opened the door, a man bludgeoned him. Two men, Darby and Ames, rushed in and robbed their home. The robbers tied and gagged Shelton. Darby stabbed Shelton, raped his wife and killed his daughter. Ames was not able to stop Darby and Shelton passed out. Shelton's case was assigned to Prosecutor Rice. Rice is known for his 96% conviction rate. He didn't want to risk losing the case, so he brokered a deal with Darby to plead guilty to third-degree murder and give a testimony against his accomplice Ames. Shelton was not happy with the deal, because it will mean a maximum of five-year jail term for Darby, who was the guy who raped his wife and killed his family. He doesn't want a deal. He believes the jury will believe him because he saw the crime. Prosecutor Rice explains that Shelton's testimony cannot incriminate the convicts because he passed out during the crime. Rice tries to convince Shelton to accept the deal instead of losing the case and get the convicts out in the streets again. After their meeting, outside the court, Shelton saw Rice shake hands with Darby. A decade later, Ames is set for execution by lethal injection. The procedure should have been painless, but a mishandling of the chemical resulted in Ames' agonizing death. The incident pointed to Darby, but when the police were on their way to arrest him, an anonymous caller led Darby to a way of escape. He was directed by the caller to an abandoned place, with a parked police car and a tased police inside. The caller assured him the car was to divert the police chasing him. Waiting inside the car is Shelton in disguise. Shelton was the anonymous caller. Darby grabbed a gun he saw in the car, not knowing it was laced with tetrodotoxin. Tetrodotoxin is a drug used to numb the muscles, but the amount of tetrodotoxin infused by the gun paralyzed Darby's whole body. Shelton then brought Darby to one of his abandoned warehouses, strapped him to a surgical table, slowly tortured him, and dismembered him. When the police found Darby's dismembered body, they suspected Shelton as the mastermind of the gruesome crime. Prosecutor Rice, together with a SWAT team, went to Shelton's house and arrested him. He didn't resist arrest. On interrogation, Shelton cooperated, cunningly answered all of Rice's questions and appeared to have admitted to the crime. Thinking he got the confession he wanted, Rice started to leave. But Shelton stopped him and pointed out his oversight. Rice asked what Shelton wanted to get him to confess to the crime. Shelton demanded a luxurious mattress be brought to his cell, in exchange for his full confession. The mattress was delivered to his cell. Shelton then admitted to Darby's murder and the swapping of the lethal injection chemical. Because Darby's lawyer has been missing for three days, Shelton again demanded an expensive steak meal in exchange for the information on the location of Darby's lawyer. He specifically instructed Rice to deliver the steak at 1 p.m. The steak arrived at 1.08 p.m., Shelton gave Rice the direction to where Darby's lawyer is, but reminded him he was eight minutes late. Rice's team rushed to the location but found the lawyer dead. They were late by a minute. The lawyer suffocated to death because his air supply lasted only until 1.15 p.m. Meanwhile, inside Shelton's cell, his cellmate threatened to hurt him if he didn't share his meal. After finishing their meal, Shelton took a knife he hid under the table and fiercely stabbed his cellmate to death. 
It was so violent that blood splattered all over their cell. When the jail guards reached his cell, he was calmly lying on his mattress, soaked in blood with arms folded underneath his head. He was transferred to solitary confinement. Prosecutor Rice was desperate for hard evidence but found nothing until his assistant found bank transactions in Shelton's account from the CIA. The head of the district attorney's office called a secret meeting with a CIA spy to get intel about their business with Shelton. The spy revealed that Shelton was not a spy but a tactician who figures out how to kill people without having to be in the same room, and he is the best in his game. If Shelton is in prison, he wants to be in prison. It is part of his plan. He warns them that Shelton has eyes and ears that see all their moves. Because of this information, Prosecutor Rice and the head of DA convinced the judge to restrict the visiting privileges of Shelton. Against her better judgment and violating Shelton's Eight Amendment rights, she agreed. After signing the document, the judge's phone rings, she answers it, and the phone explodes. Rice confronts Shelton and tells him to stop taking revenge on innocent people. Shelton says it's not about revenge, but it's about the failure of their justice system. Shelton demands that they release him at six the following morning. Otherwise, everyone will die. Rice and his whole team converged and stayed holed up together until six the following morning. When nothing happened, everyone went to their cars to leave for home. Rice and the DA chatted for a while until they saw cars explode one after another. After the funeral of Rice's assistant, as the cars slowly left, a machine gun peppered the DA's SUV with bullets, and as Rice got out of his car to rush to the DA's car, a rocket launcher blew up the SUV. Despite the mayor's anger at the failure of Rice's team to control the situation causing her friend's death, Rice was made acting district attorney. While going through his assistant's email, Rice saw an email come in with information on Shelton's property purchases. Rice investigated the properties and discovered that one of Shelton's properties is an abandoned garage near the prison. He and his colleague went to check on the garage and found a secret tunnel and materials to make explosives. They followed the tunnel and ended up in Shelton's prison cell but found it empty. They continued to search Shelton's work area and found several camera monitors and a copy of the City Hall's cleaning services work schedule. They rushed to the City Hall knowing Shelton will be disguised as a cleaning personnel. Upon reaching the City Hall, they checked all the camera monitors and saw an abandoned cleaning cart on the fifth floor. Inside the room, directly under the conference room where the mayor is holding a security meeting, they found a cell phone activated bomb. Unable to defuse the bomb, they decided not to inform the mayor and deal with the bomb instead. Back at Shelton's cell, Rice showed himself to Shelton. Rice says it is the end of the road for him and that he has made his point. Shelton asked if he was trying to offer him a deal, but Rice says he doesn't make deals with murderers anymore. Shelton is decided to blow up the city hall, but Rice warns him that if he decides to detonate the bomb, it will be a decision he will live with for the rest of his life. Shelton didn't back down. He proceeded to detonate the bomb. Rice then tells him, like I said, it will be a decision you will live with for the rest of your life which I figured by now is about 25 more seconds, then hurriedly closes the cell, locks the door, and runs. His colleague, at the same time, locks the secret door to the tunnel and runs. Shelton realizes that Rice transferred the city hall bomb to his cell. The bomb exploded, and Shelton burned to his death. The movie closes in a musical recital where Rice's daughter plays the cello. Rice missed all of his daughter's recitals because of his work. Today, he did not. His daughter completed her piece, and everyone gave his daughter a standing ovation. That's the end of our mini-movie. Can you guess the movie rating? We'll give you a moment. Law Abiding Citizen was released in 2009 and critics gave it a 26% tomato score, 
75% by the audience and Mini Movies rates it 8 out of 10 doggy treats. If you enjoyed this mini movie, you can support the movie by watching Law Abiding Citizen or following us on social media.